phone. Yeah, I have been updating it. I believe so. I have. I haven't checked that it really is reflecting the latest version I have. Yeah, I have been updating, but also you have to refresh your browser, right? Otherwise, it will show you the old version. Okay, so um, let me try and remind ourselves of ourselves a little bit where we are. So, you know, uh, we, uh, well, our goal is to show the existence of flips. We discussed that there's a reduction to PL flip. So in the situation of a PL flip, you have a PLT pair, uh, X, S plus B. So S is in a reducible divisor that corresponds to the round down of S plus B. And this is a PLT pair. So S is the only non cavamatalog terminal uh, center of the picture. And then you have a projective morphism uh, down to Z of relative Picard number 1. And the important thing is that minus, it's a small but rational morphism, minus KX plus S plus B is ample. And the goal is to show that the uh, canon pluricanonical ring, so we want to show uh, finite generation of this. And in order to show finite generation, we saw that it's enough to look at the image. So you look at the map of uh, the restriction map given by a junction. And in order to show finite generation, it's actually enough to show that the image of this map is finally generated. So you denote uh, the image of this is denoted by uh, sub s, the restricted algebra of ks x plus s plus b. This is the restricted algebra. And it's enough, it suffices to show finite generation of the restricted algebra. So finite generation of the restricted algebra, we actually went through the proof, would imply finite generation of the original pluricanonical algebra, and then the flip is just given by proj of this. The reason is that the kernel of this map is essentially you know, after some truncation is essentially uh, a principal ideal, so there's only one other generator to worry about. Okay, so we want to show finite generation of this ring, and so in order to show finite generation of that ring, the goal is to show uh, that this restricted algebra, kx plus s plus b, is actually isomorphic to some algebra of the form ks plus theta, where theta is a divisor between an effective divisor smaller than, B, than zero. And then, of course, this will be a KLT pair. So by induction of the dimension, this ring is finally generated. So that's the goal here. So. Um, uh, there's a small i here. This is true up to going to a higher model of S, but we'll, I'll try to explain that uh, soon. So I have to show you how to construct theta, and I have to try and convince you that indeed, maybe not all the sections. So this is clearly a subring of R K S plus B sub S. Maybe I don't know how to extend all of these sections but I need to show you that I can extend these sections. So I need to convince you somehow uh, that those sections can be extended. Now, of course, the tool that we are going to be using is some version of Kavamata-Vivek vanishing, and the version that we're using is called NATO vanishing. So remember what we proved last time. We proved the following proposition. Uh, maybe I won't bother stating it 
for adjoint ideals are just stated for regular multiply ideals. So n is a Cartier divisor. And I'm assuming that n minus an effective Q divisor d is ample, where d is an effective Q uh, Cartier divisor. Well, Q divisor, uh, I'm thinking, uh, in this case, on x move. OK. Then we have the higher cohomology groups of the ideal corresponding to this divisor d twisted by, um, uh, oh, well, OK, let's, let's uh, well, let me state it in the native vanishing version. Um, these are equal to 0 for every i greater than 0. We stated a slightly fancier version last time where you, instead of just having a smooth variety, you had a log smooth pair, and b was a reduced simple normal crossing divisor. And then we stated that you have vanishing of ideal of d with respect to this b kx plus n. Well, usually we write it kx plus p plus n. But I think with what I do today, I'll probably just only need this version of vanishing. So let me write that version of vanishing. So why is that important? That's important. How does that relate to the previous statement? That's important because then we get that a subjective map from, uh, uh, in this case, um, uh, OK, I can state it this way. Um, Uh, so, okay, so if S uh, contained in X is a smooth divisor uh, with no components in common with D, then H0 of uh, I um, S D kx plus s plus n subjects onto h0 i uh, d restricted to s ks plus n. OK, so this is giving you a tool to extend certain sections from a joint linear series from, from a divisor to the ambient variety. And this divisor S, at the end of the day, is, of course, going to be that special divisor that we have in the, in the PL flip. But now you see a problem. There is immediately something that's bothering you. We're not getting to extend all the sections, right? And we pretty much want to extend almost all the sections, all the sections that vanish on BS minus theta we want to extend, but we haven't defined theta. And we're not getting to extend all of them, right? Uh, we have this pesky multiplier ideal sheaf. OK, well, um, so the next uh, lemma I'm going to give you tells you that sometimes you can ignore this term. So you can extend all the sections. OK, so, so again, this seems to be a problem for our purposes. right? This ideal better correspond exactly to BS minus theta. Otherwise, we cannot extend the other sections. OK, so here's the lemma. So sigma is a Cartier divisor. D and D prime are Q Cartier divisors, effective. I'm assuming that D is less or equal to sigma plus D prime. And that the multiplier ideal corresponding to, um, I think I, I don't need the fancy version, so let's just say d prime is equal to O of x. So this just means that the ideal is trivial. In other words, that's equivalent to saying that the pair x d prime has KLT singularities. Then the ideal of this Cartier divisor, so that's just O x minus sigma, um, is contained in the ideal 
of uh, b. Uh, not b, d prime. Right, so, so you have to think this d prime is probably, this is probably happening on s, right? So we, what this, this, the conclusion says that the section sigma that I'm looking at automatically vanishes, belongs to this ideal. So if that's the section I'm trying to extend, no problem. It belongs to the ideal. So it gives me a way to check when certain sections belong to the ideal. So, okay, so what is this way? Let's, let's, let's look at it for a second. I mean, it's easier to prove than to really digest the statement. So, so what is this condition? Okay, well, um, the... Um, uh, okay, so that looks like a typo. So what do you think we should put here? You asked the right question. <laughs> right, that, that probably has to be the right thing. Okay, so what are we saying? So let's say that d prime was zero, right? Then sigma is greater or equal to d. So the ideal of sigma will be contained in the ideal of d. And since sigma is Cartier, the ideal of sigma is Ox minus sigma. So in the case that d prime is zero, this is now a trivial statement to prove. So I probably wrote down the right statement. Now, assume that, uh, you know, how big can I make uh, d prime? So, in essentially making d prime bigger, I'm making d smaller with respect to sigma and still keep this inclusion. Well, um, I, 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 can, I can increase it by at most by a KLT pair. Okay. So, it's sort of a reasonable statement. And, just think about the case d prime equals zero, and then it's an obvious statement. And the proof isn't much, ha much harder. So let's do the proof. First of all, what is the ideal of um, uh, d prime? Well, that's the trivial, right? That's, that's O of x. But what does that tell us? Well, how do I compute this ideal? Remember, this was the push forward of O x prime, where x prime is a root of solution, E minus the round down of the pullback of d prime. What is that E? That E is the gadget that appears when you compare k x prime plus uh, what notation do I want to put? Let's say gamma to be the pullback of k x plus E. So E is some kind of relative canonical divisor. Um, okay, so this push forward being equal to OX, this is just saying that E minus the round down or the pullback of D prime is greater or equal to zero, right? If you have a negative divisor here, it's going to force you to have a, a proper ideal, but it's a whole thing. Okay, um, so that's what that condition means. Um, then... Um, um, so, let's see. I look at the round down of the pullback of D. Then I claim that this is less or equal to the pullback of sigma plus the round down of the pullback of D prime. This is another trivial thing. I take this inequality and I pull it back. And then I take the round downs. This is a Cartier divisor. So the round down of a Cartier divisor is just itself. So that, that's why this comes out of the round down. OK, so now I'm just going to take this inequality and that inequality and put them together and then push it forward. So what do I get? So um, uh, this tells me that E minus the pullback of sigma minus the round down of Um, I apologize, E minus the, pull okay, let's do it this way. E minus the round down of the pullback of D. Um, yes, that's exactly what I want. Is greater or equal to E minus the pullback of a sigma minus the round down of the pullback of D prime. Um, which is greater or equal to 
to minus the pullback of sigma. OK, let's see if I did this right. So I start with this quantity. Why do I start with this quantity? Because the push forward is going to be the ideal of d. OK, now the first inequality um, follows because from here. Pull back of d, less or equal to pull back of sigma, pull back of d prime. I put a minus, so instead of less or equal, it's greater or equal to, OK, this, my handwriting is getting worse. Uh, greater or equal to the pull back of sigma minus the pull back uh, of d prime. So that's, that's just from this inequality. And then from this inequality, e minus the pull back of d prime is greater or equal to 0, so I'm just left with minus pullback of sigma. OK, so now you take this and you push it forward, and this is what you get. The push forward of O of minus the pullback of sigma, Cartier divisor, so by the projection formula, is just Ox minus sigma. And the push forward of this gadget, by definition, is the multiplier ideal of D. So as promised, it's a completely trivial thing to prove. The, the hard thing is to know that this is a useful statement and you know, to come up with the correct statement. And that's, the, you know, that's the, the curse of mathematics, right? A lot of the things you, you somehow, by playing around with it a lot, you come up with the right statement finally. And uh, once the statement is the correct one, it's usually pretty easy to prove. OK, so now, armed with these two results, this extension theorem and this uh, lemma about multiplier ideal sheaves, I'm going to prove the more impressive theorem that I stated last time. OK, so remember the statement was uh, like four lines, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so x, s plus b plus d is some um, projective. It also works in the relative setting, but let me just state it in the projective setting. Log smooth, so every divisor is smooth. Uh, the round down of B is zero, and they intersect transversely. Uh, and they have no common components, so S and B have no common components. And also, S plus B and D have no common components. And I'm going to write delta as S plus B plus P where P is some NEF divisor. And I'm going to assume that KX plus delta is Q linear equivalent to D. So, so this is really, as I tried to uh, tell you last time, it's really some condition about the stable base locus of KX plus delta, right? Because we you can pick a divisor D in this linear series that is smooth. Well, maybe if you go to a res resolution, you can make it smooth. That's not so much. The key thing that you should focus on is that it has no common components with S plus B. Right? So, so the, the stable base locus of D does not contain any of the interesting geometry of this boundary divisor. OK, and yes? So in the application, we were saying, so uh, D is given, and then you're going to try to find sigma and D prime. Is that how you apply it? This lemma, how, how do you no, actually, it's the other way around. Sigma is given. Sigma, when I write this down, is going to be the section I'm trying to extend, essentially. And then to show that you can extend it, you find some auxiliary divisor that makes all the vanishing work. Well, D and D. So sigma is zero. Right. So, so you need to find, in order to be able, essentially, this one is the one that I'll be able to extend, right? Because it vanishes along the ideal. Uh -huh. In order to be able to extend that, well, OK, if my n is sufficiently ample, no problem. I just have sir vanishing. But if n isn't ample, then I need, uh, 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 and then it's not even that big, then I want to apply this kind of kavamata vivek vanishing. So then I am looking for a divisor D with the property that it will kill this vanishing here. But the singularities of D are sort of bounded by the singularities of sigma. Oh, I see. So you really 
Yes, and then it will extend. So, so, so yeah, so you have the section you want to extend. You want to find the divisor which, uh, whose singularities on the rest restriction are pretty close to, to the section that you're trying to extend. OK, so okay, I'm only halfway through writing the statement, right? <laughs> so now, let's assume that some integral multiple, k of p and k of b, these are integral divisors. So k clears the denominator of those divisors, some, some fix from now on in positive integer k. And let's assume that h is sufficiently ample. Then, OK, here we go. For any section in k, ks plus b plus p restricted to s, and any section u in, or maybe general section, depending how I do the proof, but for some section in this very ample, sufficiently ample divisor restricted to s, and any integer, positive integer L, uh, we have then L sigma plus U is in L K, KX plus delta plus H sub S. So remember this symbol. This means the restricted linear series. This denotes the image of, you look at the linear series on the ambient variety, <coughs> right? So, so what I'm saying is I have the section sigma. I cannot tell you yet that it extends. What I can say is I fix one very ample divisor. No matter how big a multiple I take of sigma, I can extend that section. And then the next theorem should somehow uh, sort of divide this by L and take the limit, if that means anything. That doesn't actually mean anything stated that way, but morally speaking, that's what we'll be doing. Right? So. So instead of, you know, I, and, and if you're familiar from a more analytic point of view, this is a typical thing that they do uh, applying anhern Seuss theorem. They extend this section, construct a metric on the ambient variety, and sort of take the limit of that metric. You know, take the m, limit of the m fruits of that metric to get uh, a better metric. OK, so, OK, so in order to prove this theorem, all we need are those two propositions and uh, a decent amount of work. The reason why I need a lot of work is because there are a lot of uh, fractional divisors in this picture. But these proposition and the lemma, right? I mean, if you're trying to, if you're talking about sections that you want to extend, they have to be cut here. So when I write this linear series here, I want to make it up of LK smaller adjoint bits. And I can't just divide it. I can't just use KX plus delta plus H over LK, because that's a fractional divisor. It's not a Cartier divisor. So I'm going to have to sort of uh, take divide and take remainders. OK. So LM uh, will be. Uh, the, remit, the division of m by k. OK, so you take a number m and you divide it by k. This is the, the quotient that you get. And then there's a remainder. Rm will just be m minus lm k. So I just did division of uh, m by k. OK, then I'm going to set. Uh, I want to define PM will be KP if RM is 0, and it will be 0 if RM is not 0. Right? So you think of running M 
over the integers, and every time you pick a multiple of k, then pm is kp, and if it's not a multiple of k, you put pm equals to zero. Now, bm is another integral divisor, so how can I make an integral divisor out of mb? I can take the roundup of mb, but now, you know, typically when you're doing an adjunction statement, you want b to be a reduced divisor. This has, co as m gets big, this is a really big coefficient. So there's a way to view this as a reduced divisor. You now compare it with the roundup of m minus 1, b. So the difference along any coefficient between these two divisors could be 0, 1. So this is a reduced divisor, the kind of thing that you like to do a junction with. dm is going to be the sum for i equals 1 to m of kx plus s plus pi plus bi uh, and uh, uh, yes, that looks good. Um, so, so what am I thinking of this dm? Well, it's a bit like that d, right? So if you talk m kx plus delta, right, you'd expect, since delta, you'd expect to get m times kx, which is what we're getting. Uh, now, what does delta look like? It's s, so m copies of s, which we have there. And then you'd expect to get about m copies of p. Well, m copies of p won't be an integral divisor. So maybe you'll get m divided by k copies of p which is what we're arranging. Uh, and then you expect to get about MBI, right? Uh, sorry, about MB. But if I sum all of these, um, so what we'll be getting is, when I sum all of these, I'll be getting, I think, the roundup of BI. And whenever, uh, of BM. And whenever M is divisible by K, that will actually be exactly the same as mb, as long as it's divisible by k. So I'm sort of doing an integral approximation of m times that q divisor that looks as much as possible as an adjoint, uh, you know, as, as a pair, as a log canonical pair, or even better, DLT pair. OK, so for future purposes, I would like to record that this is the same as mkx plus s plus LMKP plus the roundup of MB. And I just discussed why these things appear. And let me assume. Chris, I'm sorry. Yes. What well, you said that, but why is the reason you're persisting on have some integral thing? Well, I, for example, if I want to apply my proposition, uh, I need Cartier divisor. N. Uh, yes. Oh, N. Yeah, so, so my N will be made up from this DM plus or minus a KX or something like that. So, so I, need a, I need Cartier devices in the picture, and I need, I'm going to do a proof by induction, so every time I be, need to be adding something of the form KX plus a boundary, plus a reduced boundary. So that's what I have arranged with this, with this trick. Um, OK. So I'm going to assume uh, that dj plus h is very ample for 0 less or equal to j less or equal to k minus 1. You see, k, mi k is a fixed integer. So these dj's are finitely many fixed divisors. Since h is sufficiently ample, I can assume that this finite collection of fixed divisors is very ample. And I'm also going to assume that dk plus h, so the restricted linear series, is equal to the full linear series. Um, OK, just this one. Again, this is a fixed divisor. If h is sufficiently ample, you can kill higher cohomologies and get that this this uh, equality, and um, uh, this looks uh, awfully like the thing I'm trying to prove when L is equal to 1, right? 
So this is my, the basis of our induction. Basis of induction. Right, because if you put L equals 1, it's the kind of thing that you're trying to prove. Okay, so let me write down my inductive statement. So claim, um, I know where sigma lies. Um, uh, I, okay, uh, for, for um in d rm plus h, Restricted to S, um, we have Lm sigma plus Um in dm plus H sub S. So the thing at the top, uh, so the case when uh, uh, K divides M, uh, so, i.e., uh, m is equal to lk, this is the statement of the theorem. Right, so the theorem, I'm only asking to be able to extend L sigma plus u, uh, so I'm only looking at uh, multiples of k times this quantity. Now, in my induction step, I'm going to prove something slightly harder, something slightly more general. I'm not just going to uh, uh, use uh, worry about multiples of this quantity. I'm going to look at some intermediate gadgets, right? So I'm going to look at this comes from Lm, Kx plus S, blah, blah, blah. This is the remainder. So I'm really looking at any multiple of Kx plus delta appropriately adjusted. And once and every time that L, uh, that M is divisible by K, I get the original statement. Okay, so. So we do induction on M. Um, M equals K has already been done. That's my assumption, uh, the basis of the induction. Um, so now I need to choose, right? So, so I assume it's true uh, in degree M, and I'm trying to prove it in degree M plus 1 or something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cook up, using my inductive hypothesis, I'm going to cook up an interesting other divisor that will allow me to apply the proposition and the lemma. Okay, so so this is going to be a bit of a mess, unluckily. Um, so here we go. For um, let's pick a small rational number delta between zero and one, very small rational number. Then I claim that d r m minus one plus h plus delta bm is ample. Okay, this should be a triviality. You see the remainder is between zero and k minus one, so I know that d rm minus one plus h is very ample by my assumption, and so I perturb it by a delta, so this, how small this delta depends on m, right? So given bm, I can pick a delta for any delta sufficiently small, this quantity is ample. So this depends on M. Now, well, this is ample, right? It's very ample, in fact. DJ plus H is very ample with J in that range. And this is a remainder, so it is in the range. Uh, so, uh, and this is just a perturbation of that, so it stays ample. Okay, so now um, I'm going to consider another uh, small number, epsilon, and I'm going to let f is going to be 
1 minus epsilon delta Bm plus Lm minus 1 uh, times K uh, epsilon D. So then um, X S plus F is log smooth. And the round down of F is 0. And S is not contained in the support of S. So let's check this. OK, so what is F made of? F is made of Bs and Ds. OK, but by assumption, uh, S plus B plus D has simple normal crossing. It's a log smooth pair. So uh, since Bm only lives on components of B, then by definition, F also has simple normal crossing support. So this is clearly log smooth. Uh, you just think about it for a second. S is not contained in the support of F. It's clear. How about the round down being 0? OK, so we discussed that Bm has coefficient 0, 1. So now the coefficients are strictly less than 1, so the round down is 0. And now, um, how about this guy? Well, Lm minus 1 times k could be pretty big. It's close to m. But I'm multiplying by epsilon. Again, depending on m, I can make this uh, be uh, arbitrary small, so the round down is 0. So this epsilon also depends on m. OK. Um, so now, let's pick um, w in this very ample linear series, some general divisor. Um, and let's let phi is going to be f restricted to s plus 1 minus epsilon w, then it's clear that s phi is KOT. Why is that? Because uh, f gives me a KOT divisor simply because it has simple normal crossing and the round down is 0. And now, I'm adding something with coefficient, a smooth divisor that intersects this guy transversely and also has coefficient less than 1. So again, I get something that's KLT for trivial reasons. Right? This linear series is very ample. So a general element in there is going to intersect everything. It's going to be smooth and intersect everything in the picture transversely. So this is clearly KLT. Okay. So I mean, I'm just writing some trivialities. The only thing that's not clear is, how do they know how to ch choose all of these devices, right? And it's trial and error. You know, this, this is like a fifth generation statement. And every time you prove a, a statement like this, you get better, better at, uh, at finding the right devices. OK, so I've done nothing, but I'm sort of halfway through the proof. So I guess you should say uh, this is a good time. You don't have to do anything, and it's going to uh, work out. For free. OK, I have to use my inductive hypothesis at some point, so let's do it now. By induction, there exists uh, a divisor G in dm minus 1 plus h. Uh, right, so, so I'm trying to extend this divisor in dm plus h. By induction, I know that I can do it at the previous level such that the restriction to S, uh, hopefully I can find the place in the note so I don't have to ad lib, um, G restricted to S uh, is Lm minus 1 copies of sigma plus W. Let's see if that smells right. Uh, so in my Right? So my inductive hypothesis is just this with m equal, replacing m by m minus 1. So Lm minus 1 sigma is the right thing. Um is what? It's a section in drm plus h. And here we have it in drm minus 1 plus h. So that is indeed the inductive hypothesis. Um, So 
So I think this is the last auxiliary divisor that I have to def define. So I'm going to set C is going to be, by definition, 1 minus epsilon G restrict, uh, plus F. So this is less or equal to LM minus 1 uh, sigma plus phi, which is less or equal to L m sigma plus u m plus phi. Okay, so let me let me check this. It's just it's a triviality from what we've already shown, but you just have to chase them down. So phi is f plus one minus epsilon w, right? So this f is getting uh, eaten up by the phi. Uh, There's something slightly wrong because I shouldn't be restrict. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, this is the restriction to. Oh gosh, gosh. Okay, so, so. C restricted to S. Okay, so F restricted to S. Uh, is contained in phi. So this part, when I restrict this to S, it's less or equal to that. Uh, how about G? What does G look like? Uh, G restricted to S is copies of sigma and a W. Okay, so phi has 1 minus epsilon W, so that's taken care of by the phi. And then I need this LM minus 1 sigma. Oh, there's LM minus 1 sigma. So, so this one is okay. And then, um, well, this is a bigger multiple. Well, LM could be is greater or equal to LM minus 1. It might be equal. So clearly, this part is taken care of. Uh, UM, I just added it in for good luck. And phi takes care of itself. OK? So this inequality is uh, just for why am I proving something like that? There. This one here, right? Yeah. yeah. That's where that inequality is coming. So, so that's telling me, me that if the multiply ideal is of this C restricted to S, then the section I want to extend is going to extend because I'm only off by something KLT. OK, so that's good. Um, OK, but then if I'm going to be doing that, I also need to have some vanishing theorem. So I need to know that um, uh, the numerics of C work out to give me nadal vanishing. So I better work out what the linear equivalence class or numerical equivalence class of C is. So C is going to be Q linear equivalent. OK, so by definition, it's 1 minus epsilon G plus F. So that uh, works out to be. 1 minus epsilon uh, dm minus 1 plus h plus 1 minus epsilon delta bm plus lm minus 1 k epsilon d. There's nothing magical going on. G, there's a 1 minus epsilon G, but G is dm minus 1 plus h, dm minus 1 plus h. That's right there. And then there's the F. Well, F was a bit more complicated, right? Because F was 1 minus epsilon dm plus ln minus 1 k epsilon d. ln minus 1 k epsilon d, 1 minus epsilon delta bm. So I just rewrote that stuff. Um, OK. So, OK, so we're almost there. So if I want to apply the, the proposition, uh, I need some n minus d to be ample. OK? So I'm going to preemptively compute some ample divisor and then show you that it's n minus d. So 
my ample divisor will be epsilon d r m minus 1 plus h plus delta b m plus p m. So this is ample. Is d or d? Sorry? Is that d or d? Is that d? Or d here? Yes. It's the same one. Same d. Yes. The, it's, it's the, the remainder one. Right? There, there are lots of d. There's one for every m. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, so you said you were going to apply. Oh, so you were going to apply the proposition. Which ah, one which one is the d? Probably yeah, c. Yeah. Something very, that looks like c. I haven't, the next line I'm going to show you. Oh, okay. I, so I'm so going to so reveal. I, this is all the preparation. All my uh, soldiers are ready to go to battle. But uh, okay. let's just check this. This is, again, a triviality because uh, p is an f. So I just have to check that this is ample. This guy here is very ample because this is in the range between 0 and k minus 1, and h is sufficiently ample. Delta is sufficiently small, so this th thing is still ample. And epsilon times ample is ample. So this is a triviality to check. OK, so now we are ready. We just need to check the hypothesis of those two uh, things that were done. So uh, I'm going to uh, look at dm plus h. So what's the m plus h? Presumably that's the sections I want to extend, right? I'm trying to extend the section from the m plus h restricted to s. So, um, so this is of the form kx plus s. Um, plus dm minus 1 plus bm plus pm plus h. So, so this is just using the definition of dm, right? Uh, you, the difference between dm and dm minus 1 is um, uh, going to be one copy of kx plus s, and you figure out the uh, other, uh, other terms. Uh, so this is exactly what you get. And I may have written it explicitly somewhere, but I don't see Explicitly, but it's easy to check that this is. This is what. Okay. Great. Yes. Everything is plus. Yes. Uh, oh. It's hard to see that this is a plus, huh? Indeed, everything is plus. Okay. Um, so now this is um, kx plus s. It's going to be a mess because I, I want to have c appear in there, right? So I'm looking for uh, one my, what's C? One minus epsilon D. I'm looking for this isolate that that mass in there. So uh, so I should have a one minus epsilon D M minus one plus L M minus one K epsilon K X plus delta plus epsilon D R M minus one plus bm plus pm plus h. So let's think about it. bm plus pm plus h is right here. Uh, kx plus s. Um, OK, kx plus s is right there. And dm minus 1. Uh, ah, right. So. Here's 1 minus epsilon of them. So I have epsilon dm minus 1 left to, left to account for. Everything in here, you can factor out an epsilon. So what I need to know is that dm minus 1 is ln minus 1 k kx plus delta plus dr sub m minus 1. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you, you found it somewhere there, and I can't find it. By the definition of the D R M and D L M. I feel so stupid that I cannot. Uh, help me out. Kenji, you said it's by the definition, yes. th by this line here? No, 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 no. By, you define this, uh, uh, D, R, what is this? 
Uh, I, think, I think that what one has to do here is the following. One has to get it from this definition here. So the, the dm is a sum from 1 to m. You split it into two parts, that sum. The first, r sub uh, m minus 1 terms and everything else. Uh, I take it back. Yeah. So you split it in two parts. The first, yes. r sub m minus 1, which clearly gives you d r sub m minus 1. The rest is divisible by k, so automatically gives you an integral divisor, which is k times uh, uh, km kx plus delta. So that's it. Okay. So there is something. Yeah, so, so, so you have to, so really, the thing that that follows from is the definition of lm, rm, and splitting the sum into two terms. So, uh, so there is a, a a epsilon of work that goes into checking that. OK, so now this is um, Q-Lin equivalent to Kx plus S plus A plus 1 minus epsilon dm minus 1 plus Lm minus 1 K epsilon D plus 1 minus epsilon delta bm plus 1 minus epsilon. Chris, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, second line. Is that epsilon k? Second line of which? This one here? Yeah. And epsilon and uh, there's a k there. Here? No, 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 no. The, the first line. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
so D was then equivalent to Kx plus delta, so I did nothing to this term. Um, um, something more interesting seems to be going on there. So, so, so the int okay, the not interesting part, this guy, this guy, I just here and here and uh, this guy here is here. So the interesting part is this A, one minus epsilon BM. Okay, so there's this minus epsilon B, delta BM, and then there's this one minus epsilon H or an epsilon H. And if you look at the definition of A, it's all of those interesting parts with a factor of epsilon. So that's how they match up. Okay, um, so the next step you're going to like, because this is Q-Lin equivalent to Kx plus S plus A plus C. Yeah, all of a sudden, right? I mean, it, so what was C? C was all of that mess, right? C is 1 minus epsilon dm minus 1 H, 1 minus epsilon delta, Bm, uh, Lm minus 1, uh, K, uh, oh, Lm minus 1, K epsilon D, there's an S, there's an A. So uh, if I haven't forgotten anything important, but I don't think I have, this matches up. Now you see, so in order to apply the extension result, I need, uh, I need that uh, N, so if this is my N, well, this is my N really, so N minus S and C, minus Kx plus S plus C, is an ample divisor. So the difference is ample. So that, this is telling you that sections, wait, wait, wait. yeah. N is plus H? Yeah, this is gonna be N. This is your N. And what is the D? D is C, because unluckily I've used D for a million other things here. Yeah, but the D is C? Yes. Uh, but yeah, but kx plus n there. So that's that difference of kx. And there's actually a small typo in that formula that we discussed last time. No, 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 no. You, you said n minus d must be ample, but I don't... Okay, so this is n plus kx. Oh, I see. And now, I and now I'm expecting you to say, oh, but you're off by s. Yeah, actually I actually have a typo in the previous one, right? Oh. Because, <laughs> uh, I, no, 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 I, 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 I did it right, I did it right. So in the next line, I have a plus S appearing. So I actually did, I don't have a typo there. Uh, you're right. yeah. Okay, so this, that proposition tells us that sections of H0, uh, uh, dm plus h tensor the ideal of c restricted to s extent. Okay, so now all I have to do is, uh, I asked the question is, uh, what was I trying to extend? It was some multiple of sigma plus some u probably. Uh, Lm sigma plus um. So the question I, uh, that I, I'm really hoping the answer is yes, otherwise it's all wasted. Is this guy here in here? Well, I've already checked that it's in there because I have uh, Lm sigma plus Um plus a KLT thing is greater or equal to C restricted to S, and that's precisely the lemma. So, so that's true, and that concludes uh, this proof. Oh, wait, wait. Right, so then by induction, that claim is true. Uh -huh. And whenever, this claim is stronger than the theorem, because the theorem coincides with this claim whenever uh, M is divisible by K. So that, that concludes the proof. Uh, so, yeah, so I don't know what to take away. The proof is completely trivial, but coming up with the right statement and 
fiddling with the devices. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many afternoons I waste. I invested in trying to get the right devices, right? You, you sort of, you start with, but I am, I mean, Kenji, maybe you know, you were, I imagine that somebody, when somebody proved the base point free theorem, it was a similar experience. They probably had to play, it was, you know, you're avoiding this induction, but you still have to fiddle around with the right devices. <laughs> okay, well, well, so, so, okay, so I have not done the proofs of every step and the proof of the existence of, of flips, but this is probably the hardest step part. So, um, in, in some sense, I, I did the hardest technical part of the proof. Okay, so now... Uh, uh, are you going to show us if, how you get rid of H? H. Yeah, that's the next thing. But uh, since I've used up exactly an hour, I thought maybe a five-minute break would be a good moment to take a five-minute break. And then I, I'm not going to do... There'll be another statement similar to that without the H. I won't do the whole proof. I'll show you the key part. So I'll put a couple of devices equal to zero so I don't have to do blackboards and blackboards. I can get it done in one blackboard. Uh, but you can still get the, the main idea. So you, know, you suffer through this one, but the next one will be more pleasant. So let's take a, a five minute break. To do is try and write a version of that that gets rid of the H. Well, maybe I'll need a little extra hypothesis to get rid of the H. So let me do that. But now the statement is getting very close to what you need for the existence of the uh, So. So now I'm not going to talk about a smooth pair. I'm going to move to a PLT pair. Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe let's keep it log smooth. So by saying PLT, it just means that S is irreducible, no common components with D, the round down of B is zero, and it's log smooth. Um, a is some ample divisor. Delta is S plus A plus B. Is that what it was before? Well, okay. Uh, there's an A. The P became an ample divisor, but it's similar. Uh, C, no relation to the previous C, is something effective such that S C is canonical. Um, I'm going to assume that M is an integer such that M A, M B, and M C uh, are integral divisors. I'll cut here. And uh, let's see. I'm going to pick some Q sufficiently big such that Q A is very ample. S is not contained in the base locus of Q, M, K, X plus delta plus A over M. So essentially, I'm thinking that S is not contained in the stable base locus of this linear series. And C is going to be less or equal to B restricted to S minus B restricted to S wedge 1 over qm fix qm kx plus delta plus a over m. So s. c is a divisor on s. c is a divisor on s. So yeah, so this is, that's why I wrote our criteria not in some divisor group. So this is on s. These two guys, I think, are on X, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm assuming that, that, so remember last time I sort of tried to explain why you're supposed to throw away common components between B and the fixed locus, because regardless, something that is in the restricted linear series has to vanish along this fixed locus. So, um, preemptively throwing it away, and um, then... Uh, so fix parentheses, right? Parentheses, yeah, uh, 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 well, okay, 
Okay, so you want a parenthesis. No, 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 no not there. Not, not there. there. <laughs> Where do you want a parenthesis? Uh, fix. Fix of the Q and fix plus delta A over N. Ah, because you're afraid that otherwise the symbol could mean take the fix and then restrict it to yeah, the rest. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing. This is the restricted linear series. So I take divisors on the ambient variety, restrict them to S. Oh, it's not exactly the same thing, right? Yeah. Because uh, it could have, okay, so this linear series, its base locus could be a codimension one point on S, which is codimension two on the ambient variety, yeah. so it would not be measured by that. Okay, so you, well, there's no harm in putting an extra. I don't know, too many. <laughs> okay, I have a tough task now. <laughs> Sorry. I could have sort of, if I, if I said a, a sort of a stable base locus with multiplicity, I could have avoided that actually. And there is one more question. Sure. Uh, when you write fix, this is the uh, divisors in the fixed locus. Is that what? Counted with multiplicity. Counted with multiplicity. Yes. So that's your notation. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. Because right, because otherwise, here I'm taking the divisor in common between this and that. That's otherwise, I would just be throwing away the whole component. No, I just want to, essentially, I want to look at B, and I want to say, well, if something in B is contained in the stable base locus, it shouldn't really be that. So let's subtract off. So when you write FIX, you only care about the divisor part of the Yes, the fix. yes. Okay. okay. That's all we care about. Yeah. And it's a bit surprising that you can get away with that. Um, but somehow the canonical condition is helping you. Like canonical is saying that there's no higher interesting centers, you know, higher dimension interesting centers. Okay, then, okay, here we go. M, K, S, plus A, restricted to S, plus C, plus M, B, restricted to S, minus C, is contained in M, K, X, plus delta uh, sub x. Okay, so, so, okay, so, what I'm saying is I cannot just extend the whole linear series, but I can extend those sections which vanish along this guy. Right? So essentially, I guess this should be my theta, the thing that I'm thinking about theta. Now, have I done something bad? Not at all, because when you're looking at the restricted algebra, as I tried to explain, the restricted algebra has to vanish along these things, right? It, it has to vanish along something, it has to vanish along the fixed linear locus of this. But, okay, so let me, let me emphasize that. The fixed locus of, uh, oh my gosh, I, I need to put it, okay, this is fine. And, Kx plus delta uh, sub s is contained in, well, maybe I should put, yeah, it's contained is greater or equal to q to 1 over q, the fixed locus of the thing I have up there, q m k x plus delta. This is just because if I take this linear series times itself q times, I land in here, so this fixed locus time is less or equal to q times this fixed locus. And this is greater or equal to 1 over q, the guy I have up there. Right? Because if I add a little bit of an ample divisor, the fix, I have more section, and so the fixed locus will be even smaller. Right? So, so, so if, I'm look, if I'm trying to apply this to something about the restricted linear series, I know that every section in the restricted linear series has to vanish along this divisor here. Right? It has to vanish along this fixed locus, because that's bigger than this smaller than this, right? And in fact, I have room to spare. Any device along which it vanishes 
This inequality will be strict because I have this ample. So for Q sufficiently big, the ample will kill off a bit of that component. Right? So 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 this, you know, I have some room to spare. Now I'll try to say a bit later. I'm gonna use that room to spare when I prove that theta graph. Okay, so so that's why this is sort of a robust statement, the statement that's going to be useful. So when you try and prove it, it's similar to the proof of the previous result, but um, uh, I'm just going to emphasize uh, the key step, the key difference. So if you know about multiply ideal sheaves, this is very much reminiscent of the fact that multiply ideal sheaves are integrally closed. Right, what does integral close this mean? It means that you multiply your function, you take powers of the function multiplied by a fixed text function belong to powers of the ideal, then the original function becomes to belongs to the integral closure of the ideal. It's essentially the definition of integral closure. Well, here we have that multiples of the divisor times a fixed multiples of our function times a fixed function belong to some linear series and then I'm sort of uh, leveraging that. So it's very simple. Okay, so let me see. May depend on Q. So you have not found theta, which is independent of. No, I, I need to. I need to then set all my theta. But that that's going to be pretty easy. Uh, but yeah. this this theta depends on Q. Yes. Right. So, so so essentially, what you're going to do. So if you, you want, want to define find, this guy find. here to be theta sub q or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you take the limit of those. Now, the limit will be some horrible real divisor. Uh -huh. So then you have to do the Fanta for approximation. That will be your c. Something like that. And this is not, this is, this is the thing that this is a, uh, yes, you should just my mistake. Theta Q. That's what it is. I'll define it later. Let me show you the key step of proving this so that you believe that uh, uh, something like that can be done. So, um, so let's assume, let's make some simplifying assumption uh, that C is equal to B restricted to S. So I don't, this is just, makes my life easier so I don't have to write B restricted to S minus C everywhere pretty much. Um, and uh, here I have my se section sigma in M K S plus so A. Right. right. So assume that you're lucky and the fixed locus has nothing in, com in common with the restricted to us. I see. Uh, now you take the section that you want to extend, right? I think that's the thing that would. So now this is zero. So we're supposed to extend any section in here. C is equal to B restricted to S. We want to extend that section. OK, so um, uh, by previous theorem, we have that L sigma plus U uh, does extend. Is an L times M K X plus S plus A plus B plus h s for every l greater than zero and some h <coughs> fixed sufficiently ample device. So this h does not depend on l. That is key. Okay, so in other words, um, uh, we have this extends, so you have a device that I say gl in that linear series, which when I restrict to S, I get this device. Okay? So now, I'm going to look at the following. M, K, X plus S. I erase the proposition, but I'm trying to apply the proposition. Minus K, X plus S plus G, S. Well, let's put the coefficient in front. M minus 1 over L, M, G, S plus B. Okay, so this is the thing I'm going to take the multiplier deal sheet for. What's GS? GS? Oh, GL. Uh, Can you rewrite G? That doesn't look like 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> okay, so, so this is numerical equivalent. I claim to A plus, hopefully I did my computation right, because I'm simplifying a proof. So. Okay, so let's see, uh, did I get this right? So, m minus 1 over ln gl, what's that linear equivalent to? Well, the ln will cancel with this, it's the equivalent to uh, m minus 1 kx plus s plus a plus b plus a. Uh, so, m minus 1 kx plus s, uh, and another kx plus s, that's n copies of kx plus s. So that's taken care of. Uh, then there's m minus 1 copies of b and another copy of b. That's taken care of. I did not put a copy of a, so I have one a left over. There it is. Uh, and then uh, how about the h's? There are no h's on this side. There's an h, there's an ln h in here, so I get um, uh, uh, hopefully. Uh, I get, I put the wrong coefficient, but it's still going to be okay. So it's m minus 1, come on, I put the correct coefficient here, yeah. m minus 1 over ln copies of h. h has no coefficient here. For some, I was worried that there was an ln h, but there isn't. Okay. Okay, so now, for L sufficiently big, this guy here is ample. So that tells you that the cohomology, higher cohomology of, uh, uh, of M, Kx plus S plus A plus B, tends to the ideal of M minus 1 over Lm, Gl plus B, is equal to 0. Uh, a is ample, H is ample, yeah? Yeah, and, and there's a minus here, but it doesn't matter. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's still ample. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, it's, well, otherwise there's yes. no or point L, in saying yeah. <coughs> okay. yeah. So that's ample. <coughs> so, um, uh, I'm supposed to say minus S here. S there. Okay. So this H1 is 0. High cohomology, this is just my natal vanishing, right? Because this is, in the old notation, this was your n plus kx plus s. So now, if I get rid of the kx plus s, then this is that divisor that I have to put. This, this is what, in the old notation, was the divisor d. So I have to check that n minus d is ample, which I just checked. Then Higher cohomology of kx plus s plus n minus d is uh, sorry of kx plus n minus d is zero. That's why there's a minus s there. And so that is telling me that I have subjectivity. Let me not write what this group is, but the sections that list are the sections in m k x plus s plus a plus b restricted to s tensor to the ideal of this messy divisor m minus one over Lm. Okay, this divisor restricted, well, let me just write, uh, restricted to S. What is GL restricted to S? It is L sigma plus U plus uh, B restricted to S. Okay? Now, B restricted to all I need to do is I need to check that sigma vanishes along this ideal. So I need to check that this quantity is less or equal to sigma plus KLT. So let's look at that quantity. That quantity is, I'll uh, just rewrite it. It's less or equal to, okay, L. L M M minus one, that's less or equal to sigma plus uh, B restricted to S plus uh, 
m minus 1 over ln u. Okay, so let's think about it. I want this to be KLT. B restricted to S is KLT. For L sufficiently big, this, quanti this is a fixed U. So for L sufficiently big, this is a sufficiently small perturbation of a KLT divisor, so it's still KLT. That's plus, yeah? Yes, that's definitely plus. Plus, so this is KLT <coughs> for every L sufficiently big. Because this quantity here is going to zero, and this is a fixed divisor, so uh, if you have a KLT divisor plus a an arbitrary small divisor, that's again KLT. KLT is an open condition. And this implies what? So this implies that, so this divisor is less or equal to sigma plus KLT. The lemma, remember the first lemma I did today, says that then sigma automatically vanishes along the ideal of this divisor. So sigma automatically vanishes along this ideal. So sigma is in this group, so sigma extends. That's what I wanted to prove. Right, so, so the punchline in these extension theorems is always two things. One, some H1 vanishes, so you have subjectivity. And two, the section you want to extend lies in the ideal. Actually lies in the group that you can extend. This, you know, algebraically is pretty easy to do now that you've seen it once. It's, it's just, just this computation here. When you do it analytically, it's much more complicated, but you can get stronger results. So if we did not have a little bit of ampleness, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this. That's why Sue's methods work for uh, Free genera for uh, intermediate quadratic dimension as well, not just for general. Okay. Okay, so there's two more things I need to do before we're done, and I might actually be able to do it, which much to my surprise. One is I should I should actually give the definition of those data cues and try to explain, at least give some intuition, why the limit is actually a rational divisor. And two, I should show why for a PLT flip, we can see this, a PL flip, we can assume all of these extra conditions. That you can write it as S plus ample plus B, and you can assume that this C <coughs> is canonical, all of these kinds of things. Right, there, there's a few extra technical conditions that are not uh, in the uh, in the definition of PL flip, but they're easy to arrange. Okay, so this next statement has, if I can find it, has the definition. Yes, here we go. So now, x is q factorial. I'll stop pretending that x is projective, but I have a projective morphism <coughs> to the fine variety. I'm going to still have an ample divisor. Sorry. Yes. Uh, where did we SC canonical conventional in your proof on the uh, blackboard. So I know. Uh, ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Where did you? So I know morally what's really going on is you are sort of trying to subtract off common components common components between the fixed locus and V. If you want this to be robust from a rational point of view, you would like this condition to be verified on higher models. If it's canonical, there are no components of this that live on, on higher models. Now... Yes. I think that's what's going on. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so, so I have this projective morphism for the fine variety. I have this ample divisor. I have a PLP pair. It's no longer log smooth, okay? PLP. And um, then um, I'm going to assume that uh, S, um, B sub S, so this is a gadget induced by a junction. Right, so kx plus s <coughs> plus b restricted to s is ks plus bs. I'm going to assume that this is canonical. Uh, and I'm going to assume that the stable base locus of kx plus s plus b plus a does not contain s. And then let me let Fm be the fixed part of M. Does not contain S. Thank you. Okay, X plus S plus B plus A restricted to S. And I'm going to divide it by M. Okay, so this is our friend from over there. And then I'm going to take the limit of these guys. So f will be the limit. I'm going to say the limit of fm factorial, because otherwise it's not completely obvious that you can compare them. You cannot compare f2 and f3, but you can certainly compare f2 with its f6 and f3 with f6. So let's just take the limit of fm factorial. We'll just make, you don't even have to think that way. Then we have theta is going to be b sub s minus b sub s where f. Uh, so the claim, so a priori, this is an R divisor on s. And my claim is that this is a Q divisor. Uh, the two divisor, and if k is an integer such that k kx plus s plus b plus a and <coughs> a ks plus theta plus a are Cartier, then R S K K X plus S plus B plus A is equal to R K K X plus uh, theta plus A. Um, everything is looking good, right? Okay, so this is almost exactly what I want for a PLP flip. Uh, the only difference is, why is this extra A here? Yeah. It'll be easy to put there. We'll do it in a second. And why is it canonical? Maybe I'll do the reduction. That I'll, I'll tell you why this implies the theorem directly. But it's almost exactly what you were expecting, right? But the A is there. Yeah, but, okay. So let, let me show you why this implies. Uh, the flips, and then let me say a few words about how to prove this. Okay, so I'm deliberately doing the easy thing first. So, what does a PL flip look like? We have f from x to s. Uh, this is a small rational contraction. I can assume that s is a fine. Ooh, I don't, I don't want to call it s. Let me call it z, maybe. Small rational. We can assume that z is a fine. Uh, we have x, s plus d 
is PLT. So already you're saying, oh, you're a bit off. You're supposed to have B plus A, and you only have S plus B. OK, this is PLT. Um, what else do we have? We have minus KX plus B is F ample. We also have that minus S is F ample. We probably don't need to use at this point. We already used it to you know, know that it was enough to show that the restricted algebra is finally generated. Uh, getting the, um, did we use that? Yeah, we used that improving Shogro's result that finite generation of the restricted algebra implies finite generation of the whole algebra. Where did we use minus S is To We used it because uh, subtracting S shifts the degree down by one instead of shifting it up. It was just, just in the mechanics of showing that the, the kernel is an idea. Otherwise, you get the kernel is something sort of a, oh, something I, not contained in the ring. I missed the that. So we did use it there. At some point, I wrote I wrote minus a k f or oh, a k x plus s plus b is linear uh, equivalent to b I, x. Yes. You remember that, so yeah, that's what I was using. Be <coughs> a positive. I uh, okay, so getting back to the situation. Um, so this is my uh, PO flip. It looks a bit like that, but not really. So I'm going to uh, massage it a bit until it looks exactly the same. So I'm going to pick. Uh, so I'm assuming that Z is a fine. So any divisor on X has lots of sections. The only base locus of a linear series on X is just the exceptional set for this map. So now I'm going to pick S prime, linear equivalent to S, uh, set which has no common component. We've done this before. And I'm going to pick B, which is going to be, well, B I have. I'm going to, it's big, so in particular it's Q linear equivalent to, let's say, A plus C, where C is effective and A is M. Right? I mean, this is a small map over a fine variety, so any divisor is big. So now I'm going to let A prime be epsilon times the sample divisor, and B prime is going to be 1 minus epsilon B plus epsilon C. And then uh, obviously, Kx plus S plus B is Q linear equivalent to Kx uh, plus S plus A prime plus B prime, where A prime is ample, B prime is effective. Now you may say, oh, wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. When you chose this C, it could happen that C has multiplicity along X, right? So in that case, you would destroy the PLT property, right? Because the key thing in the PLT property is that the multiplicity of B along S is zero, right? So what do you do if C has a multiplicity along S? Wait, say again, PLT is just that there is no, uh, S is the only. Only thing of coefficient one. Yes. If you add, if, if C vanishes along S, then, right now, inside my B, I have a little bit of S. So now the coefficient of S will be bigger than 1. So, so I really need, to do this trick, I really need to know that C has no, no component in common with S. Oh. I, I need to guarantee that. Oh, I but that's super easy, because I just told you that S is really equivalent to something else, which is not S. So suppose that C was alpha S plus a divisor gamma, then it will be Q linear equivalent to alpha S prime plus gamma. Oh, now it has no component of S in it. So, um, um, so that was easy. So uh, by, by this chip, you can also assume that X is not in the BS. Of the I can also assume that what? Uh, the x is not contained in the b x of the kx plus x plus b plus a. Ah, yes, 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 yes. But I want s to be contained 
I mean, I want it here, right? Ah, it's not contained in the BDS. Yeah. Um, so I thought, was, I thought it was part of it. That's part of the assumption, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so more to the point is when I do these perturbations, I never <coughs> run into that problem. Uh, so, okay, so now uh, I'm still slightly unhappy because, why? well, it's not canonical. Uh, right? But I can blow it up and make it canonical. I can take a terminalization of S, essentially. So here's, here's the picture that you have in mind. If this is your S, and on S you have two components of B that uh, maybe have coefficients like two-thirds and two-thirds, then this is not canonical, because if you blow up this point, it will appear with multiplicity one-third. So blow it up. And then blow it up, uh, well, that, in that case, it'll be, you know, blow it up as many times as you need to make it canonical. But, so, but yes. The, then you are changing the situation. S was sitting in X. What do you mean by blowing it up? I don't know. Okay, so now. Hey! What do you say, Chris? He's going to write it down. I'll write it down. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so I. I I'm preparing, I'm telling you what I'm going to do, and now I'll do it. Okay. So, so I write KY plus uh, gamma is the pullback of KX plus S plus B prime plus A prime plus E, where as usual, E and gamma have nothing in common, and they're two effective divisors. And now this guy here is PLT. Right, because whenever you uh, take a log resolution on a PLT thing, you still have a PLT thing. Uh, and we can assume, so, so let's let T be the strict transform of S. We can assume that when I do, uh, when I consider T and gamma <coughs> minus T restricted to T is canonical, is terminal. I want to assume that it's terminal. Okay, and then you say, oh, great, you've done it, but then you say, oh, wait a second, uh, I want that gamma contains an ample divisor, right? So, so this gamma is the S plus B plus A, it has to contain an ample divisor. So why is that? So you see, what I'm going to do is, let's say, let's pick... Why is it terminal? Why is it terminal? Because uh, you, uh, uh, you you take uh, a Are you sufficiently high blow up? Yes, a sufficiently a high blow up, I can guarantee that it will be terminal on S. Uh, so it's a part of the condition of G? Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. it, of course, if I take G the identity, <laughs> I know. that's okay, not going to so happen. So what you're saying is, pick G such that... Such that, exactly. Okay. Such that... I, I make, and now I'm going to pick f an effective divisor such that minus f is a g ample uh, and f is exceptional and let me add epsilon f to both sides here then you see gamma will be greater or equal to the pullback of a prime uh, 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 okay, I don't want to add it. Uh, um, yes. Uh, gamma will be, so what I'm going to do to gamma is I'm going <coughs> to add epsilon f and subtract epsilon f. Because you see the point here is that the pullback of a prime minus epsilon f is. I'm sorry, Chris, I cannot read. Thank yes, I, I will. Gamma is what? Okay, so gamma is just gamma. So now I'm going to perturb gamma. Well, I'm not going to perturb it. I'm just going to uh, rewrite it. Sorry, sorry, I cannot read. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. 
I'm rewriting gamma as gamma plus epsilon this effect exceptional divisor minus epsilon the exceptional divisor. Did nothing, right? But now you see gamma contains a pullback of A prime. If A prime is a general ample divisor, then the strict transform of the pullback of A prime are the same. So gamma will contain the pullback of A prime. Minus epsilon f, that's an equivalent to an ample divisor A. Uh, let's call it A or Y, an ample divisor. Okay? So, so what I'm doing is I'm replacing gamma by a Q linear equivalent divisor to gamma, which is gamma, sorry, gamma is Q linear equivalent to gamma prime minus epsilon f minus uh, g alpha star of a prime uh, plus a y <coughs> gamma prime is I take gamma, I subtract epsilon f Add epsilon, okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to replace gamma by the following divisor, which is Q linear equivalent to gamma, anyhow, which is what? I add epsilon f, I throw away the strict transform of A prime, and I put in this AY, which is M. So replacing gamma prime by an appropriate Q linear equivalent divisor, I can assume that it contains an ample divisor. <coughs> and this epsilon f doesn't harm me because if that was terminal, this plus epsilon f restricted to t is also terminal because terminal is an open condition. So this is sort of a standard manipulation which shows me that starting from the uh, PLT situation, uh, I can reduce myself to this more special situation. In fact, I can even assume that x is smooth, right, that's a log resolution. So I can assume that x is smooth and uh, uh, that makes my life easier, I guess. And the divisor uh, in question, uh, I guess, has simple normal crossing. I can assume that too. So, uh, so all I'm trying to say is that there's some standard reduction from the PLT flip case to this situation. And now, in the last five minutes, try to reduce, uh, try to uh, tell you why this theorem should imply that theorem. Yes. So there's two parts. One part is to show that theta is rational, and the second part is to show that uh, all the sections extend. Yeah. Okay, let's assume first that theta is rational. Right? So, so what we're trying to show is that we have this implication. <coughs> oh, that's so, okay, but that is like smaller. Sorry? C is smaller. So it extends. No, if it's uh, rational. We've got a trick. C is smaller than this minus that. Oh. But this is actually, I told you that this is strictly smaller than the fixed part. Oh. So. Uh, that may not be satisfied. No, 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 it's easier for this to be satisfied. So, so C does not have to be, it does not have to be smaller than B. You don't actually have to subtract off the whole fixed locus. You have to subtract off like 1 minus epsilon times a fixed locus. So actually, this theorem is much more powerful than it looks. You can extend more sections than you think. Okay. I, oh. This, this, this factor here allows you to fudge things a bit, and that's how you know 
a priori that the, the base locus on the ambient variety restricted to S is the same as the base locus on S. But, but this middle one is smaller than theta, no? If no, it, that's what I'm trying This thing here is not smaller than theta. Why okay. Not? Okay, so, so that, that's kind of the crux of the argument. So let, let me let me let me go in the order I was planning to go. So let me start by saying if we know that theta is rational, yeah. then uh, we can extend the sections, right? Yeah. So so um But my problem is the middle one might be smaller than theta. Okay, so it's not. It's not. Okay, so let's let's to get some feeling, suppose theta is rational. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so let's suppose that k theta uh, is an honest, we can clear the denominator, is an honest divisor on it. Okay, uh, so I was looking to see if I explain this in my notes. Uh, okay, then a plus theta, hopefully this helps, minus b restricted to s, minus b restricted to s, minus 1 over q, m, f. This is essentially what you're asking about, so it is m. Okay, so let's think about what I just wrote. Uh, our example for every q sufficiently. Okay, so... So how, um, so how do I get, um, so how do I get theta? Um, I get theta by, uh, yes, by this recipe, right? I do, I, I think I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah. I, I, I do bs, and I subtract off bs minus f, where f is the limit of these fixed parts, these fm. So this fm cubed is the same as that fm. It's the fixed part of kx plus s plus b plus a. And, um, and um, OK, so the limit of devices like this is theta. So for any ample, so eventually this difference is small. So any ample, and it's supported on finitely many, on the support of B. So it's every coefficient is small, and it's only finitely many divisors. So eventually this guy becomes M. I'm not saying anything. Deep. Okay. So so then um, that should be enough to say that the sections have to extend. Um, uh, so, so what I write down, and then I hopefully can justify it, n kx plus s plus, uh, I guess, uh, uh, maybe I want to say k, x plus s plus b plus a. <coughs> Uh, should be the same as m k s plus theta plus a plus m b s. So you, you're actually trying to show for sufficiently large q the coefficient of the right hand side becomes the same as theta, the last term. Is that what you're trying to show? Well, okay, so so now I've assumed that it's rational. So what I'm trying to show is that this theorem is going to apply to give me that these sections, the sections of this form extend. Right? That's what I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to do. With it. So is the, is it showing that the theta, a plus theta, is actually uh, the coefficient of theta of some component in theta, and b restricted to s minus b restricted S wedge one over QM FQM, they have the same coefficient if Q is something like yeah. large. Yeah. Is that what you're yes. Okay. Yes. So okay, so let's let's think if this follows from that. Hopefully I didn't I didn't 
Uh, and that's the top. So what am I supposed to check? Uh, what I need is that uh, uh, C, I need to subtract off is it more or less than something? So, so yes. So here, um, this says that I can extend all the sections as long as I subtracted off at least this much. So what I have to check is that I subtracted off possibly more than this. Okay, but that's what I just erased here because. What I subtracted off was the uh, stuff in common with the base locus of this linear series. This is my delta, right? Whereas here, I'm only asking that you subtract off stuff in common with this linear series where I've got an extra ample device in the picture. So this guy here is a milder condition. I'm asking you to subtract off less stuff. So, so this is fine. That, that satisfies that problem. So now, rationality. rationality is a bit more involved. You have to use this little flexibility. So what is that? What the rationality is telling you is that in fact we had a bit of room to spare in the argument that we just did. So suppose that theta uh, is a real device. <coughs> then what you look at is some other device of C, which is a Q divisor, which is sufficiently close to theta. So that it still satisfies the inequalities that you need to extend sections. Then you know that you can extend sections. So you know that the stable base locus of this linear series is exactly the same as the stable base locus of the corresponding linear series here. But that, this one, is rational. Because you have a rational divisor and you're in dimension one less, so you can apply finite generation of the fluid canonical ring. So, the thing that you're afraid is irrational and gives you an irrational theta divisor, the stable base locus of this linear series, you can now compute to be rational. So to... Oh, wait, wait, I, I don't understand the last part. So what's that? Okay, so I take C, which is close to theta. Then, right. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so we know, so instead of this statement, you'll have it with M... K S plus psi plus A. Uh, so if I look at this base locus, this is um, well. Okay, so are you taking C from low, uh, from smaller or upper? Okay, you're asking too many questions <laughs> because no, no, no. I, I, no, no, no. The the point is, if you want to get it right. You have to ask the question, is it from upper or from lower? Off the top of my head, I'll get confused if it's from upper or from lower, right? And in order to get it right, you have to use the Fontana approximation. Because in order to check that everything, you know, the right, the difference is still ample, etc., you need difference between these two devices to be small with respect to the coefficients. So that's done with respect to the Fontana approximation. Uh, I think you want. You pick a coefficient of theta that's irrational, you pick C to be uh, uh, just slightly smaller, and then it allows you to compare the stable base locus, low side, maybe it's slightly bigger. So, but the punchline is that if you look at the limit of fix of this divided by M, uh, this is a Q divisor. By finite generation on S, which you know by induction of dimension. By the fact that you can extend section, that tells you that tells you that all the coefficients in question are rational here, but you had some coefficient that was irrational, you're assuming that theta was irrational, and that's a contradiction. 
because you, you're just saying that some component with an irrational coefficient which becomes rational when you restrict it to x. Okay, so I'm being <coughs> quite sketchy about this part. Uh, it's about three pages in the notes to do it right. And you have to say uh, the words that and kind approximation, and you have to consider the smallest rational fine vector <coughs> space spanned by theta. Uh, so it, it is a little bit thick. But, um, but the main idea is just once you can lift sections with this extra degree of freedom of A over M, you can really compare the base low size on the ambient variety and on the divisor. On the divisor, they're rational. So they have to be rational in the end of the right. That's, uh, yeah. So uh, sorry I didn't get to do the details of that part. And I stop here. I'm a couple of minutes over time. Sorry. Thank you.